There you go. All right. Thanks so much for coming to this month's legal aid meeting. Um, as you know, we're here to talk about the 2020 census, and we um, are so pleased to welcome Anita and Cindy from Forefront's Democracy Initiative, who are here to talk to us about the census, how it works, uh, why it matters, the policy landscape surrounding the census, and what we as legal aid attorneys can do to get involved and to help. Um, particularly with regard to our clients. So um, thank you so much to Anita and Cindy, and we'll let you take it away. And don't forget to sign in for CLE. Is this Hi, I'm Cindy Canary. Um, and thank you for being here today. Um, we're going to talk about planning for a complete count. Um, we're talking about the policy landscape in the introduction, and in one word, it's complicated, very complicated. <laughs> Um, the census is always a big job. It's always difficult. It's always hard. There are always hard to count communities. Um, in 2020, we're anticipating it being difficult by magnitude 10. So there are some real challenges. It can seem like it's a long way away, but it um, is time that we, uh, we get moving on it. Let's see if I know how to work this. I just need you to do it for me. <laughs> so, um, so our, our job really is to get out the count. The count is essential. So the goal is a full, accurate, and then I want to underscore the last word, and confidential count. Um, and that's a challenge. It's a challenge to motivate people to respond to the census, particularly communities who might be fearful of some of the questions on the census and of the administration's intent. Um, so how do we get there? We get there through trusted messengers, community partners, effective messaging, and really doing our research and our legal homework in advance. <laughs> um, there's an awful lot at stake. Um, you probably have seen in the papers that we have um, population outflow, that our numbers are going down. We are almost guaranteed to lose one seat in Congress. There is a chance if we don't count every last soul that we will lose two seats. Um, and this has a huge impact in our clout in Congress, our ability to get resources, our ability to be heard, and just the very representation of people in this state. Um, in resources alone, Illinois takes from the top 16 programs $19.7 billion every year. Those are on census allocated programs that allocate money based on population. So it, you know, We've all been living in a bankrupt state for some time now. I think it was in the Tribune yesterday or today that each and every one of us and our dogs and our cats owe about $11,000 a piece for the pension. We can't let this money go. This is critically important. And this is money that um, really serves the programs and the people that we care about. This goes to early childhood. It goes to health care. It really is about... Um, creating infrastructure in communities. And finally, information, yes? Uh, sorry, this may be a dumb question, but we're gonna lose those seats, presumably because the state population has decreased, and has the state population actually decreased? Yes. It has. Yeah, we um, actually, um, the census is the big, you know, every 10 years we count everybody. And it should be just like one, two, three, four. It's much more complicated than that. But um, in between the census, the Census Bureau actually conducts the American Community Survey, does projections on people moving in and out. In the city of Chicago um, alone, there's estimates that we've lost somewhere in the region of 36, 38,000 people. It's um, shown up most significantly at CPS, where we're seeing um, a lot of kids not there. Um, and we've also got downstate loss. And um, I mean, it's it's, it's its own subject, where people are going, why people are going. Um, but for the census, for Illinois, the bottom line is people are going. We, think, we know we have a net loss. Um, 
which means that we really have to count everybody. And if we if we miss whole segments of the community, we could lose two seats. Um, the final point here is information, and, and it's important to understand that census data is really the building block upon which all decisions are made. It's how we figure out where to build roads, where to build schools. It's how Walgreens decides to put up Walgreens on your corner or Starbucks or what, you know. It's all of those things. It's um, really projecting for the next decade where we need houses, where jobs will be. So it, um, without this data, it, and it doesn't give us any ability to plan and to plan um, in ways that um, support population flow. The census um, is just kind of a key part of the political dynamic. So you have the census in 2020. You go into the redistricting cycle in 2021, um, which is based on census numbers. We talk a lot about um, political gerrymandering in redistricting. You can look at the census and say it's pre-gerrymandering. If we don't get the numbers, if we're redistricting based on bad data, we're already skewing representation. You go from that over to voter engagement, elections, new representatives, and it's just a cycle that goes on and on. So I said that this would be one of the most challenging censuses. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. This is the first so-called high-tech census, which means that most of us in this room and most of your clients will get census data via the computer, electronically. Um, the Census Bureau, um, which has faced incredible budget constraints, has tried as much as possible to go to an online system. So instead of going out like they did 10 years ago and like they've always done verifying every address, um, now they're using other data. They're using administrative forms. Um, they're really not relying on a lot of field personnel. Um, so with the advent of a computer census, there still will be, just so that you know, there still will be a component of human enumerators. And for the first time ever, there will be an opportunity to call in your census. Um, and apparently do it in 12 or 13 different languages. Um, but with a computer census, there are a number of issues. First of all, um, cybersecurity risks. Um, with Experian, with Target, with, you know, you know, the scandal of the week with, <laughs> with Russians. Um, people are afraid to put data online, so this is a particular concern. Also, the ability of people to have broadband and ex access the form varies dramatically. Anita and I were down in, uh, outside of Carbondale last week, and we were in one town, and they talked about their town <coughs> computer. You know, we take it for granted that we, you know, all have mobile technology in our back pocket, but that's not the case everywhere in this state. Um, we did check, though, and um, the census will be something that people can uh, fill in on a cell phone. So it is being designed locally. Um, budget shortfalls. The census has been... Um, pretty dramatically underfunded. In this spring, in the omnibus appropriation, it got a huge bump. It got about a billion dollars. Um, it's coming a little late in the game. So, um, so they haven't had the money until now to do what they normally do, which is test the instrument. Normally they go out um, in three different um, communities and do what's called an end-to-end -end test. And that's like a complete fire drill. Um, this time around, because of budget shortfalls, they're only doing the test in one place. They're doing it right now, and it's in Providence, Rhode Island, which may not be the most representative city in the country. <laughs> I don't know. You know. <laughs> I know I, we, when we were in Carbondale, people were like, Providence, Rhode Island? 
<laughs> um, so not doing this testing is adding to a lot of um, concern. There's another thing about um, the testing, um, and we'll get to this in a minute, but I just want to highlight the decision to put a citizenship question on the uh, census was made after the test went into the field. So it's not being tested. Um, there's a leadership vacuum at the census. Um, the director left about a year ago. He was very well respected as a statistician, a demographer, nonpartisan. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> There's nobody, nobody now. <laughs> so it's a bit, the office is being run by the acting director. Um, we don't think anyone will be appointed at this point. Um, finally, um, you all probably have read about and heard about the citizenship question. Um, that question is um, creating a lot of concern and raising a lot of fears in communities throughout the country and, and certainly within our state. It, um, it is a question that has been asked before. It's been asked on the American Community Survey, which goes to a smaller group of people. But the climate seems very fundamentally different right now. And the fear level seems very, very different right now. Um, and what we are hearing from people is um, people who work with um, immigrant groups, people who work with um, DACA, and just a lot of alarm and a lot of concern. And we're hearing it from, from families that have mixed immigration status, um, families that are citizens, um, people who are here as legal permanent residents but are not citizens because it's a yes or no question. Are you a citizen? Not just um, so there is a lot of concern about that. Um, um, even without that question, there are a number of traditionally hard to count communities. And these communities kind of tend to overlap with each other, but zero to five year olds, little kids, we, we just lose thousands of them. <laughs> um, the African American community, Latino community, Asian Americans, minorities, low income families, immigrant communities, certainly undocumented individuals, the disabled, the homeless, renters. If you look at um, the map of Illinois and you look at where the various universities of Illinois are, you see this huge dip and you're just like, what's going on in Champaign? What's going on in, you know, in Northern Illinois? What it is, is um, students cramming 10 people into one apartment, <laughs> having one guy on the lease, and we lose the other nine people, if we get anyone at all. Or students thinking, well, mom and dad fill this in. We don't have to. Um, there's a website down here, Census Hard to Count Maps 2020.us. I encourage you to write this down and take a look at it. It's, um, you can actually zoom in by state legislative district, by congressional district, by neighborhood, really zoom in and look at where hard to count communities are. And sometimes it's quite surprising. Um, so it's, it's a great tool and I think it will really help us in figuring out where we need to go in and mobilize. Um, so 2020 census mobilization, um, let me just back up one, one second because one of the questions always is, well, why should we, I know, yeah, I know about the money, I know about the representation, but why should we mobilize to get people to fill in the census? Why should we tell clients and others to fill in the census if you know, it's got these threatening questions and other things? Um, one reason is it's a federal law to complete the census. Um, so if, if you do not fill in the census, you have violated federal law. If you do not complete the census when they send it to you online, you are for, far more likely to get an enumerator at your door. So again, it ups the ante. What's more threatening, having 
and on the computer or having someone at your door. I, um, but these are important things to think about. It is also a crime to advise someone not to fill in the census. Um, so in many ways, this kind of boxes everybody in because you don't want to put anyone in the position of violating a federal law and giving the government different reasons to come to them. Yes? If people ask us what are, um, what is the penalty? Is it a fine? Or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is, for individuals, it is a fine. I believe it's $500 a person. Um, traditionally, you know, people haven't been prosecuted. I think that, you know, the thing is, we don't know what the pattern is going to be going forward. So, you know, in the history of forever, I think one person's been prosecuted. But, and, you know, I mean, I think that when you talk to people who work in the immigrant rights community, the concern is, all right, if the census data is co uh, confidential and it's not shared, but we're able to go after people for not completing the census, well, that's, a, that's another reason um, to, to move to deport people. Um, so again, that underlies why we really need to get people to fill it in. Um, and for organizations, um, just to finish your question, the, there's also a fine and is at a greater magnitude and apparently have some sort of horrible multiplier on it. Um, we need to secure campaign funding so we can get people out in the field. Um, we need targeted message messaging. We need legal clarity. Right now, there are a number of lawsuits um, about the citizen question, particularly, including several um, state lawsuits. The first one was filed by California, and then there was one um, that uh, the recently resigned Eric Schneiderman filed um, from New York that Illinois, Chicago, and a number of other states joined into. Um, these suits are primarily based on the fact that the Constitution says we will, we will do a count every 10 years. We will do a count of every person. It doesn't say every citizen, it says every person. And also on the fact that, that the way that we're testing and doing other things is in violation of the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, I think there are a lot of legal questions. There are a lot of legal questions still about confidentiality about whether um, it is at a threshold that is significant enough um, for this time in history. Um, so all of that is being looked at. Um, we need to understand and address community concerns, um, ma really map out the hard to count communities, know where they are, know who um, the trusted allies are, and know how to get to them whether it's through technology, transportation, different kinds of organizing, whether you go to the daycare or the healthcare center or the church or whatever. Um, we need to engage partners, um, and that's what we need to do really early on. And address the obstacles. Are there some things that we can make better? Are there, are there things that we in the state can do just to make it a little easier to count people? Um, and then we need to share information amongst, um, amongst the community generally. Um, one final thing before I hand it over to Anita is um, just to know that what we're doing in Illinois also plugs into a big national effort. And nationally there's an attempt to raise um, a very significant about, amount of money, um, including $2 million specifically to target the citizenship question. And that's being done through research um, to really document um, to the extent possible how it may impact the count and in what communities. Um, legal research, um, and that's being led by the Brennan Center in New York and the lawyers, or, um, the, um, oh, the leadership, the leadership committee. Um, um, on, um, research on the census, legal research, 
coordinating amicus briefs and possibly bringing more litigation. Um, I think there's also some legal work that will be done the, down the line in terms of setting up at least a loose infrastructure to mobilize kind of a la what's done after the immigration bans when all the lawyers went to the airport, um, if, if need be, you know, thinking ahead so that we can protect um, our communities. Um, education, advocacy, uh, communications and messaging. So there's a lot going on. Um, people are trying very hard to get out in front of this, um, but it is very much kind of a moving picture. And um, I will turn it over to Anita now to <coughs> tell you what we're doing in Illinois. Thank you, Cindy. So I'm Anita Banerjee. I'm the uh, director of the Democracy Initiative at Forefront. It's a new initiative at Forefront that was launched in January. It's a three-year endeavor to focus on civic engagement in the traditional sense, uh, voter registration, voter education, voter um, engagement, but then taking it a step further um, and ensuring a fair and accurate count in the census 2020 um, and using Forefront's traditional role of uh, convening, so bringing our statewide membership of funders and nonprofits together um, to be able to work collaboratively on a fair and accurate count. And so the way in which we look to do this is um, in this in this uh, picture, this depiction is that we are working closely with the U.S. Census Bureau. They have regional offices across the country. Uh, we've got one in Chicago, I believe. Their regional office services eight states and it's the Midwest region, but the regional office was opened in April in Chicago, not too far from the forefront office. So we're working very closely with them um, in, in, in these various areas. Another way to look at this is this document that I had um, shared with Angela earlier so that you may have in front of you. This kind of uh, outlines forefront's work a little more directly. But this, um, there are various hard to count working groups um, Forefront is working in three areas, and they're in these green uh, bubbles here. We've got an Illinois statewide uh, complete count commission. This is this bubble right here. This is state statute. It's been pulled together in the state legislature by uh, two state senators, Senator Maddie Hunter and Emil Jones III. It's a public act. It's public act 100. Dash zero three nine zero for those of you who are you know want to get geeked out and read uh, what what it all entails. But essentially, it pulls together a statewide commission that will have twenty two members uh, that rep are representatives from various parts of the state to uh, talk, come together and talk about best practices and strategy and how do we engage the various hard to count communities across the state. Um, to be mobilized and have information that ensures that people get counted. Um, they had their first meeting in March. They had a second meeting in May. Um, in that uh, meeting, my boss, Don Melchiori from Forefront, was able to share more about Forefront's work. And we look to work very closely with them. It's being facilitated by the Secretary of State's office. This is actually a group that, if you're interested, you can get involved with. They've got a number of working groups um, that will be looking at various hard-to-count communi communities across the state. Um, and so if you're interested, let me know, and I can uh, connect you to the Secretary of State's office um, that's facilitating this commission. And the second is this complete, uh, this Illinois Count Me In Statewide Advocacy Coalition. It's the middle one on this diagram and that would be over here in this bubble. This is being um, led by Forefront, but absolutely we cannot do this work alone. So we're being led in a joint effort with a number of organizations that have statewide presence in the form of a steering committee. Right now we've got about 20 groups at the table, including groups like the Chicago Urban League, MALDEF, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and ICER, to name a few. We've got other groups like the Farm Bureau, um, and SEIU that are interested but can't engage just yet um, are hoping to get more involved after the midterm elections. Uh, but essentially the steering group comes together to kind of talk about uh, what are ways that we can engage collaboratively but then also be able to take this information and share it within our various constituencies. 
And so um, one example of that I will give you, which I think is another way that you all can engage as you think about um, getting involved in the Census 2020 efforts, is this idea of public comment. Right? So Cindy touched upon amicus briefs, and absolutely that is another way for you to get involved. But what Forefront will be engaging in is to provide sample language for individuals, for organizations, for foundations, to be able to put together your own comments, public comments that can then be shared with the federal registrar and to be able to form a federal uh, record across the country of organizations that are speaking out against the citizenship question being on the census form. Uh, there are numerous reasons why having a question such as a citizenship question on the form um, pose challenges to a fair and accurate count. And this is our opportunity to be able to voice those reasons. Um, we don't know yet when that comment period will open up. We're hearing conflicts that it could be as early as next week. It could be as late as July after the 4th of July holiday. We just don't know at this point in time, but we're keeping close tabs. We work very closely, if you'll see on the diagram, with our two national um, organizations. We've got the Leadership Conference that is kind of the lead on all things census in terms of advocacy work for nonprofits. And then we've got this Funders Committee that's the funders lead with a number of national funders, including the Bauman Foundation, that helps um, to determine how we can get more funders across the country more engaged in um, the Census 2020 efforts. And so the Leadership Conference is working very closely, as Cindy mentioned, with the Brennan Center for Justice in figuring out the legal pieces, but also tracking uh, when that public comment period will open and being able to share information with Forefront and other organizations across the country that can then distill this information down um, by state. It'll be a 60-day period, and so it'll be an all-out two-month effort, which Forefront hopes will be able to gather hundreds, if not thousands, of um, comments that we can then share nationally. And then finally, the third um, circle and the third area that, Il that Forefront is uh, really helping to facilitate is an Illinois Funders Collaborative. And the Chicago Bar Foundation is uh, a part of that. Uh, this was a collaborative that was pulled together in 2010 for Illinois by the Joyce Foundation. And while it was received really well, it was a short period of time and a smaller amount of money. However, we had 10 funders from Illinois that pulled $1.25 million dollars together in a short amount of time um, and we had great outreach in the greater Chicago area. Forefront would like to be able to expound on the number of funders to bring even more dollars to the table so that we can do a statewide RFP in early 2019 so that we can engage even more organizations across the state um, in, a, in a longer grant effort uh, so that we can do some intentional outreach to those various hard to count communities. And then finally, um, this block right here is the city and county committees. So as we mentioned, there's a statewide commission, but traditionally there are numbers, hundreds of uh, complete count, what they're called committees across the state by county, by city, by, by local community of community leaders and elected officials that come together <coughs> to ensure that there is representation and information shared uh, for a complete and accurate count. Um, however, because there were so many in 2010 and they didn't all talk together, they felt the need to pull together this commission. So while there will be a commission, we are encouraging local communities to create their own committee so that local leaders have a stake in the game. So that's really it in a nutshell. Um, these are the three main um, areas in, in green that I mentioned that uh, Forefront is helping to facilitate. But I wanted to draw attention really quickly to the, this document here. This lays out more of Forefront's work in those three buckets of work. And the first page really kind of has some talking points about why it's important for a fair and accurate census, right? And so Cindy touched upon, upon this $9.7 billion that we receive annually uh, from the federal government that's at stake, right? That's segments of it, um, if we don't have a fair and accurate count, we will not receive. There is a really great breakdown, which I was not able to provide. It's by Andrew Reamer, and it's called Counting for Dollars. It's on here, if you Google it, it will pull up by state the amount of dollars 
that um, each state receives federally annually, but then it also breaks that down into the various uh, federal programs that the money goes to. I, I find that to be really um, informative and helpful when you're trying to do advocacy related work on, on the census. And the other one was that hard to count mapping tool that was on this slide here. This one. This is a fantastic tool because, as Cindy mentioned, it really zones in on the various um, communities across the state. Right? So if you were to look at it by congressional district, if you zone in on Congressman Foster's district, you can print out a map of those various hard to count communities. And they'll be in shades of red to orange that kind of show you where those various uh, communities are. And so um, back in January, I did a in-district meeting with Congressman Foster out in his Aurora office. And once I showed him the map, he was all geeked out about it. And he was like, you know what, Anita, we need to do something. We need to organize and have a community briefing. And so Forefront is engaging in five community briefings this summer, one of which we're doing with Congressman Foster in Aurora, which is a hard to count community, um, has a, a large Hispanic population. We're working, we're trying to work with our various community-based organizations that are leaders in their right on the census work. So we're working with ICER to co-sponsor this event um, in late July. Um, and that is one of the five that we're looking to do. Um, if you've got connections with elected officials, if you think that you can get them to do a community briefing, please let Cindy and me know, because uh, we would like to be able to engage from now until early 2020 to do as many as that we can. The other four that we're doing is, uh, are with um, Cook County. We're doing one with Commissioner Garcia, who's working with Commissioner Moore, We've got the Chicago Urban League in Maldef that will be co-sponsoring that in a hard to count community in Cook County. The third one we're looking to do in Rock Island. There is a specific hard to count community out there and uh, Congresswoman Cherry Bustos' office is being um, contacted so that we can do one out there. There's a really great foundation out there that is really interested in the census work and so they're taking the lead on that one. The fourth one we look to do is with Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy out in Schaumburg. That's a huge um, immigrant ethnic uh, community, as you may know. And so we're looking to do one in July after the 4th of July holiday. And then the fifth one that we've got on the books right now is with Senator Duckworth. She is very um, much interested in being a leader on this census work. And so I, I had the opportunity to meet with some of her DC staff yesterday. And we're looking to do one in August and hoping to find another part of the state that has a large hard to count community so that we can, we can really do some intentional outreach. So then finally, I uh, wanted to let you know that as we pull this coalition together, sure we've got a steering committee and we've got organizations that are, that are part of it, we've got these four working groups, right? We've got these opportunities for people that are interested to step up and help provide guidance, support, um, and help us do this work together. Those four are on this diagram in orange. We've got our state appropriation, we've got communications, policy concerns for the various hard to count communities, and then of course our get out the count um, field working group. These are working groups that you are more than welcome to participate in as you have time and availability. Let me know and I can connect you. Uh, three of the four are engaged right now. Um, the, the get out the count one, we're kind of holding off on just yet as we get more of the pieces together uh, because we're not yet going out into the field. Um, and then finally, the larger coalition, I keep saying finally, I apologize. <laughs> um, the larger coalition is, is an effort that you can be connected in as, as closely as you'd like or as loosely as you'd like. And we look to launch that in September. And really it'll be an opportunity to engage a couple of times a year between now and probably June of 2020 um, to receive resources, information, and have examples of ways that you can get involved in advocacy efforts. Um, we will be launching that, I believe, on September the 20th. Uh, Arturo Vargas, the CEO president for Naleo, nationally will be our keynote speaker. Um, and while we will have uh, a place in the Chicago area where we will gather, it will be webinar format so that, it, it, it will, so that we can reach out to folks far and wide across the state. Um, so that's what I have for now. I want to open it up to questions. I know it's a lot of information, 
So as, as you think about it, if you if you want to reach out afterwards, you're more than welcome to. Yes? I have a very preliminary question. Sure. What is the issue with citizenship? So uh, is the census going to say if you are not a citizen, you are not counted? Is that what they are vouching for? What What is the sense? Yeah, so let me start and then you can jump in. So it's it's really complicated, right? So the citizenship question was part of the census form in the early 1900s. And then about 1950 or so, they decided to do away with it because you don't really need that information because when you look at it constitutionally, the census is to count all residents in, in, in the United States. But by putting a question like that on there, in, in a politically charged environment where people are already, if you're of immigrant communities, of mixed you know, status families, there's already a little bit of a fear of where will my information go? If you put that question on the form, then there is great reason to believe that it'll hinder the count because even less people will be um, willing to fill, out, fill it out, even though we know that it's federal law. Um, and then also, you know, it, it will raise concerns of if I do fill it out accurately, right, will this information go into the hands of someone, even though it's supposed to be confidential, right, right? We, we just don't know. And that uncertainty creates fear. And when there's fear over something such as the census in such a politically charged environment, um, it doesn't bode well for a fair and accurate count. I had a related question on that. So I know I'm not an immigration lawyer, but I know that there are immigration consequences of voting if you're not a citizen. Will there be similar repercussions for someone who mistakenly puts that they're a citizen if they're not a citizen, or do we know? <laughs> if you knowingly fill in the form falsely, yeah. Um, again, I think that you're uh, putting yourself in, in violation. I mean, technically, the citizenship question, technical, technically, in this most benign sense, is so that statistically we know how many citizens there are and how many non-citizens there are. But how it will actually be used is another question. And the the door that it came through was um, through the Justice Department um, with um, Attorney General Sessions saying that we needed this data to better um, implement the Voting Rights Act. Um, it, there's a lot of skepticism about that argument. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but I think what's important to note from all this is that we don't know yet if that question's going to end up on the floor, yes. right? right? We've got these five um, lawsuits that are pending. We've got pieces of legislation that are in Congress that if the legislature is to turn, right, there might be an opportunity uh, for the question to be kicked off. And the fact that it's untested, right? It's not in the field as of yet. We don't think that it will be at all. Um, so there are so many grounds and opportunities to make to lay the case um, for it not to be on the citizenship or to, for it not to be on the census form, as well as if we create this large uh, federal record with various people commenting on why it shouldn't be, um, we're hopeful, we're hopeful that it may be kicked off. Um, and so we also know that in early 2019, this information needs to be, this needs to be decided. Right? And so if we don't get the results or of the, the verdicts of the lawsuits by April of next year, and that's, that's kind of a loose timeline, then um, it's a stalling tactic, right? And then there's a real chance that the question won't end up on the form because the forms have to go to print, and they have to go to print about a year out from the actual um, count. I'm sorry, I think you had a question? What do we know about why was it removed? Because they realized that they didn't need it, right? They didn't Did need it. Did somebody litigate it, though? No, no, we've asked that. And um, it, it was an administrative decision. It wasn't yeah. litigated. Um, and, and, and they decided that they would have it in the sampling questions mm -hmm. that go out after the, the decennial census every 10 years. So they had enough information to be able to run with um, the accuracy of the Voting Rights Act. So they didn't really need it, is, is what it was determined. And I've also read that as you think about the civil rights era and the movements, the various movements that happened from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, um, it was enough, because the census by constitution is for all residents, they felt there wasn't the need to have that question on there. Yes? So 
Uh, is it possible that we were saying that like maybe April of 2019, the draft forms might hit the Federal Register, at which point we could see what questions will be on there? Yes. Okay. That is, yeah, April 1st, 19 is the, is the deadline for that. Um, can you talk a little bit more about you know, the confidentiality of the information? I mean, we talked a lot about penalties of not responding. Mm -hmm. um, what are the penalties for sharing that information in an inappropriate way? It's, um, the penalties are quite high. The, first of all, there's a 75-year protection on, on data. So it's supposed to be confidential for 75 years before it's publicly released. Um, if it's shared from agency to agency, there is the potential of up to a half a million dollar fine. Right now, I think that the lawyers that we're working with are evaluating, um, are really trying to poke holes in this, you know, and evaluate how strong this protection is. One of the things that Anita and I heard is there may be an attempt right now the census data comes out in a, in a pretty granular block level. And so you, you might not know that um, you answered that you weren't a citizen, <laughs> but we, we know pretty much what you know, block you live on. <laughs> um, so there's some talk about trying to get the census to only release the data in larger increments a lot of stuff is being thought about and um, you know how, how it will be received, what will happen, we don't know, but a lot of people are really trying every effort to um, make sure that this is a safe process and that no one is put in harm's way by completing the census. And so the Census Bureau has also um, indicated that more of those guidance um, and those guidelines will come out once there's determination of whether that question is on the form. So there's just a lot of unknowns at this, this point in time. I, I have one more question. Yeah. <laughs> so um, are there any other substantial changes or things that weren't added? I know there was a lot of attention around um, like a sexual orientation and gender identity mm -hmm. questions that it's my understanding were not added. Um, is there anything else like that, or could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I, and I'll let yeah. you talk to that, but another example I have of that is that there was a lot of work done in the last decade in terms of how do you build a census form that is uh, more representative of the various communities that make up our country. And uh, there is a professor named Julie Dowling at the University of Illinois in Urbana who's on the National Advisory Council for All Things Census at the Census Department. And she is like a census guru, like a genius, and has really like delved, delved into this issue, actually has written a book on it. Um, and she had, was showing, Cindy and me, we met with her in Ur Urbana last week, she um, was showing us how the form has evolved over the course of time and what the form should have looked like for the 2020 census. Now, I don't remember exactly what that was, but there were various, um, there were various communities within ethnic communities that were supposed to be representative. There were supposed to be um, check boxes as well as open space for people to be able to fill in by hand as they felt comfortable regarding LGBTQ status. Uh, and also that um, Middle Eastern North African category. And I bring that up because I met with the Arab Americans Family Services Organization out in Bridgeview this morning. And they were very incensed about this because they've been fighting this for the last two decades on having their own category, um, that they shouldn't be identified as Caucasian or white when they are, that's not representative of who they are. And that question uh, was supposed to be, from what, from what Cindy and I gathered, part of the form that was supposed to be approved for 2020, and it hasn't been. The only thing that I would add is that the Census Bureau has spent a lot of time and money field testing the census instrument, and they did that mid-decade, and then they didn't t follow their own findings. <laughs> and, and, you know, the other thing that we got from that, that really rich meeting with the professor was that the, there's so many people at the census department that are really invested in a fair and accurate count and have been there for years, and now under uh, our current political leadership, uh, it's difficult because you can't fight for so much of the stuff that you have worked so hard on. 
questions? All right. Well, thank you to Anita and Cindy. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. And it sounds like there are a lot of ways for people to get involved, which is really great, you know, depending on your time and your interest. And so I hope you all individually think about that and take that back to your organizations and think about it um, that fits into your mission. Um, just really quick, a few things. One, um, as Rebecca had to run, but as she said, um, don't forget to sign in for CLE credit if you need that in the back. Um, to our next and last meeting of the bar year will be in June, and it looks like we're going, we're going to be doing another documentary screening um, for that. Um, if anyone actually has any um, suggestions as we choose a documentary for something that is related to civil legal aid, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's shockingly difficult to find something, but we will find you a good documentary, um, but we, we welcome suggestions as well. And then, um, and also that is an hour or less, <laughs> which is a whole other thing. Um, but um, before I do other announcements, just a quick legislative update. April was a big um, active month for us um, at the CBF and at the CBA um, legislatively. So for one, um, we did the annual trip to DC for American Bar Association Day. We lobbied for um, additional funding for Legal Services Corporation um, funding. And we lobbied for um, pr preserving the public service loan forgiveness program and other student debt reforms. Um, and then third, actually, it was an interesting time to be out there. A lot was happening. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg um, was testifying while we were there. Um, Paul Ryan announced he was resigning. Um, I think um, there was a raid or something. It was just like a lot. And, and at the same time, Jeff Sessions and the Department of Justice announced that they were um, temporarily suspending the legal orientation programs and immigration court help desks. Um, and so we added that at the last minute to our advocacy agenda. And um, a lot of other people were out there advocating for that. And luckily, they did reverse course um, and said that while they're still going to review the programs, even though they've been reviewed um, and have been found to be successful, that they won't suspend them while they're doing that, um, which is a big success. And on the Legal Services Corporation front, um, this had happened before we went out there, but it did get an increase in the fiscal year 2018 budget, which is really great. And so we're just continuing to push to close the gap because there's still a huge funding gap. It's, it's still underfunded. As, as the census is, or was. Um, we also went to Springfield, and that was joined with the CBA's Young Lawyers section, which was a really great trip. Um, Leslie uh, joined us for that trip. Um, and there we advocated for our three bills, and I'll give you quick updates on those as well. Uh, fees and fines reform, which is, this is the second year of that um, push. Um, I, I'm happy to report that it has made it um, through the House, and it has made it through the Senate committee, um, and so now it goes to the Senate floor for a vote hopefully, and then to the governor for a signature. So um, this, we're very excited about the momentum on this bill, um, and so we'll keep you updated. Um, as I said at the last session, if you want more um, regular updates, if you want to get our advocacy alert, so when you can take action, file witness slip, et cetera, just let me know, I can add you to that list. And then the two, two other bills, one is our plain language task force bill, um, which we've talked about at pre previous meetings, uh, that bill, is up for a um, how so it made it through the Senate and it's up for a House committee hearing next week. Um, so we will be sending out an actual alert about that. Um, we we think we're in good shape there. Um, Representative Laura Fine has taken that up um, in the in the House, which is great. And then the last bill that we're working on is simplifying affidavits and court proceedings to not require notarization. And um, that bill also has made it through the Senate and is up for House Committee on the same day on Wednesday. So the action alert will include both bills. Um, actually, uh, Representative Breen has taken up that bill in the House, um, which if you're not familiar with Representative Breen, um, I think it shows how uh, bipartisan and nonpartisan most of the bills that we're working on um, are. They just make common sense um, for most people. And so we're really excited to, to be able to say that and to show that. Um, by having bipartisan support for our bills. Um, so that is a legislative update um, in a nutshell. Are there any other announcements, events, anything else that anyone has that they want people to be aware of? No? All right, great. Well, we'll just we'll let you out a couple of minutes early. We won't tell. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.